Hello, good day, and welcome back. So today we're going to be looking at C++ and how you might take a C++ program and break it up. C++ do things mostly similar to C. So you're going to see a lot of the same things in terms of how you can um, break up your source code with um, that H file. And C++ also had namespace. When you reuse code, of course, you have to say which namespace it's in. The only effect is really when you go to reference things, um, it just by having namespaces, it gives you the opportunity to remove um, a lot of things from the global namespace. And if you want to access something that's in a different namespace, you have to explicitly say, I'm using that thing in that namespace or reference it. Um, all this is not going to make too much sense if you don't know C++. And again, we can't really dive into everything because that would mean spending some time trying to learn the language. So a lot of this stuff, especially the coding part, is going to be sped up because, um, again, it's, I'm going to take a while to convert the C stuff into C++ and I'm not trying to really teach it. Just want to show you, but it's all there. If you can slow it down enough, you'll see me type it all. All right. So we're still looking at the same application, same requirements for the application, user input, get some data from some pretend remote server, do some complex st stuff on it, use um, storage and clean it up. And this is where we start seeing how C++ and why C++ probably came around, not only to give you object-oriented programming, but one of the benefits of that is that it helps with how objects can be cleaned up or resources can be cleaned up. But you can still have memory leak in C++ because C++ still allow you to call malloc or even say new and not delete and um, point it to an object. But with some of the things that came in C++ later on, like auto pointer that wasn't there in the absolute beginning, but came later um, in later revisions, and I can't remember which one auto pointer was introduced, but now you have auto pointer that can really help. An auto pointer can be used everywhere, so you still can have memory issues with um, in C++. You can use auto pointer, for example, in the standard containers, like vector, but for the most part, most places where you normally use a pointer, you can use an auto pointer. So I'm going to do the same thing here. Like I said, we're going to break our application up pretty much the same way, and we're going to go with the idea that we can have sub-modules. Again, in C++ and C, you don't really have modules, um, so we just, we call them modules here because they don't have any other name for it. I guess in C++, you can really call this a namespace. Um, like I said, in terms of reusing code, um, at the source level, you really just have namespaces. And once you compile your code, it's either going to be object files, archives, or libraries. That's it. Just like C plus, just like C, sorry. Okay. Nothing new there. Okay. Let's get to coding. So we're going to start off by copying the, um, code that we wrote for, um, C and then modifying it. And we're going to do that. Um, we have a lot of work to do. We'll have to remove. First of all, we don't need the make demo file anymore. So we're going to remove that, rename our app demo back to make. We can clean up some of this other stuff that we've done in the C code that, um, to say what was built in, like to get an idea was really core to language and you don't have to include a file to get. And so now that we sort of have, um, our code cleanup, now we're going to go straight into now modifying this into some C++ code. And so what we're going to do is, like I said, I'm going to use auto pointer because almost anywhere, if you're a C++ programmer today, where you would normally use a pointer, in C, you probably want to use an auto pointer unless you have a really, really good reason not to use it. I'm going to pretend um, that I have some factory method methods. And in object oriented parlance, basically what a factory method is, is just a function or a method that is responsible for creating other objects. So sometimes if you imagine that you want to model a car factory, for example, um, coming out of the car factory is a fully assembled car, but going into that car are a number of parts. So if you wanted to model that, you would have a car factory method or function. And when you say create a car, you give it some parameters, like I want some sedan, some two doors, four doors, blah, 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 large engines, and so on. And then it would go ahead and get all the other individual objects and assemble them. Because if you have tons of objects, a lot of objects or classes, sorry, and you're going to create instances of them, so then you need to just put them, wire them together. So that's where the factory method and factory function come in. It's like it wire up very complex objects together. So that's what we're going to pretend here, that there's a lot involved in trying to create a UI, um, even if you provide all the parameters. And so we're going to have a factory function that sort of take all those parameters, do all the grunge work of giving you a nice UI object. And we're going to pretend we have the same thing for SQL connection and so on and so on. Um, Notice also that um, with C++, we have the opportunity to write classes. And what a class gives us, a class is almost like a struct in C. Um, it's very much like a struct in C. As a matter of fact, when you use a struct in C++, um, it's essentially a class that defaults everything to public. And 
Um, so in C++, you can get away by just using a struct and then just saying everything is private. Um, but again, we're not teaching C++, so we're not going to really get into too much. But one of the advantages of C++ over C is that in C, we have to use function pointers because in C, there was no way to you for you to embed a function in a struct. So the only thing you could do is use a function pointer. And the advantage of that is, is it helps you with that whole namespace that I talk about. If you have too many things in the global namespace in C, it can cause collision. So one way to hide it is inside your C file, you would say static. So if you really want somebody to use something then that you have a static in that C file, well, then you expose it through a, um, like a function pointer, like in a struct, for example. And so that gives you that sort of usage that people might be accustomed in object oriented programming where they have an object and then they call methods on it and it looks the same in C. Um, and so it's, it's kind of cleaner also. Um, there's a little indirection, so there's a little performance in it because when you call a function through a pointer, it's not the same as calling a function. But the benefit you get of having slightly cleaner code and so on, um, I think most time outweighs that. And it's, it's nice because then your struct look like an interface, so it's clear to see exactly what a person can do and what it can do. All right. So now that we've sort of finished coding up our C, um, C++, now we're going to try and run it. And uh, this is failing because there's still some errors um, in the code, which I'm going to go fix. Um, in addition to that, um, I still have all my C files, um, my C++ files, they're really C files, you know, that C with C++ with C code in it. So I really, I need to change that also. Um, so after modifying the file extension and fixing some of the errors, one of them being, some of them being that in order to use the auto pointer, I need to say std colon auto ptr and also need to include something from the standard template library. So that would be like IO stream or something. Um, and I don't want to say like using um, namespace STD. So I just included um, one of the um, pre-compiled editor. And so I just went with IO stream instead. All right, so now that we fixed all those issues and we can make a build, we can run it of course and test it. But one of the other thing I want to do is to be able to put our UI code into a namespace. UI code to pretend like if we got this from, you know, even if it's our company, but somebody else decided to put it in a namespace. And it's always good if you can write a large bit of code to put it in a namespace, especially when you're exposing a lot of um, classes and objects and functions and so on. You don't want it to collide. The probability might be small that you and other, somebody else might use the same name, but it's also possible. So best to put things in namespace. So I put it in a namespace called AA and notice oh, using the namespace is just the same as using this STD namespace because it's written the same way and it's used the same way same tools you have for organizing a code is the same tools um, the library builders and the compiler builders are using to give you the rest of the, the C++ language in the standard library or whatever. Okay, all right, so that works and that is pretty straightforward and easy. The, so the next thing I wanna do is we're gonna take our storage set of file and UI file and put it in a shared object file. If you remember in what I talked about C and even C++ I said it, so one of the things you can do is take source code, compile it to object file, then take object, those object files. They're sort of like a library already. This position independent code. And then you can link them, um, compile them into an archive or you can put them into a shared object file, which is sort of like an executable. And so what I'll do is I'll put a make file within each one of the directories. So I'll put a make file in the UI directory and a make file in the shared, um, storage directory. And then I'll modify each so that they, when you call them, it builds a library. And remember what I said. And what we did see is that if a library name is called libzoo.so, when you go to use it, you're also going to say minus L and then zoo. And that means like libzoo. Okay. You'll see what I mean. So since our library is called libui, when I go to use it, I'm going to use minus L UI. And then lib storage is going to just be minus L option to say I want to use a library um, storage. As you can see, it tells me it's always a dynamically linked library. Now these libraries are now sitting in my directory and the operating system, Mac, I'm on Mac, doesn't know where it is. So when I time for me to run my application, as you go see, it's not gonna be able to find the library, but it's a way to tell it where to find it. Now when it comes to my main application, um, since I'm using libraries, I can just use the files that I'm gonna provide and I only need to modify my flags and my linker flags to say that I'm gonna use minus the capital L says this is the path where you find the libraries. And the lowercase l said this is the name of the library. So probably a little bit confusing there, but we're not going to focus on it because I just want to show you that how, this is how things can be done. I want to focus on making sure that you necessarily can go and do it because it's just more to it. So I have something now. So let's um, try and run my executable. So you see I have an executable was linked against my two library and you'll see that it fails. And 
So if you're on a Mac, what you want to do is export DYLD for dynamically loaded library path equals and then colon the paths for your library. In this case, I have two libraries and they're two different paths, a UI directory and a storage directory. And then, of course, if there was some other value that was set before for DY lib LD library path, I want to append that also. So I'm saying search first in my directories, UI and storage, then search the other directories. And now you can see when I rerun my application, it runs just fine. Now, if I install these in the standard directory where other libraries are, which when in, I did um, section one, I show you that was in slash user lib for me, um, then I wouldn't need to modify the library path. If you're on a Unix computer, you might be able to run the LD command. If you put it in the, the, the um, standard library directory, run the LD config command to reload it. Um, also, at least that's what you used to do. Um, also, you might be able to do the same thing by exporting the, exporting the path LD underscore library underscore path. So pretty much the same as on the Mac, except you don't do the DY. If you're on Windows, I have no idea. All right. So that's it. Um, basically, the key takeaway here is C++. Give you some nice things in terms of cleaning, um, of being able to organize your code with scope and so you don't pollute the namespace with, um, pollute your global namespace by using namespaces. And, um, other than that, I mean, the other thing about constructors and destructors and classes, so that our code look a little bit cleaner than it does for the C, um, that's going to come later on when we talk about object oriented programming and, um, whether, and the benefits of garbage collection. Um, being able to have resources be cleaned up for you instead of you have to track it um, like you have to do in C and to an extent in C++, but C++ goes a far way in helping you. So we'll cover that sort of thing later. Follow me on Twitter, Straversity1, Instagram, Straversity. See you in the next video. Do subscribe. Um, spread the word. Have a great day.